Um, so hello, my name is Stu Donlin. Uh, I'm the new registrar here at the Crescent Butte Museum, and I'm filling in for Ashley O'Hare, who is our curator. And uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the thrilling history of Gunnison Country with Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The museum recognizes that we are all guests here on this land, which is historically, which historically is Ute territory. Crescent Butte has no known names under the Ute language, but we do acknowledge that the Utes were forcibly removed from this area by the Brno Treaty. Uh, this series will explore locations which were historically used by the Ute tribes for hunting, gathering, uh, and traveling prior to their forced relocation by the federal government. Uh, land acknowledge acknowledgements can help educate as well as inspire call to action. Uh, opportunities to help indigenous communities can come in many ways from donating to an organization like the American Indian College Fund, which empowers native youths in our country, or simply researching the native tribes of your local community. This can garner a better understanding, which can build compassion, and more compassion can, leads to can lead towards allyship and reconciliation. Uh, so please take some time to consider the different opportunities that are available to you. Um, the museum is currently closed Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for the month of November. However, we will be hosting a historical talk with Dr. Vandenbush next Monday, November 14th. Uh, the talk will begin at 7 and will be focused on the Colorado Water Compact, which was signed November 24th, 1922. Uh, we're approaching the 100th year anniversary of the compact, which is, which is extremely important and relevant to the future of water in the state of Colorado, as well as the West in its entirety. Uh, refreshments will be provided, so come by the museum November 24th uh, at 7 p.m., where Dwayne will be talking about the historical significance and poss possible future of water laws in the West. Uh, this program is being recorded, which will be available on our website, crescentbuttemuseum.com, and our YouTube page. Uh, if you have any questions about our programming, you can check out our website, or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, feel free to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we also post all upcoming events in the newspaper. Uh, finally, a special thanks to our lead sponsors, uh, Bud Bush from Bluebird Realty, uh, Coach Eber Saloon, and Dave Taylor, aka KOA Dave. Uh, without your sponsorships and donations, these programs would not be possible. So thank you. Uh, if you'd like to make a donation yourself, visit our website, uh, crestbutemuseum.com. And yeah, so without further ado, uh, we will begin. Thank you, Stuart. We're getting ready to go here. I want to, again, uh, as Stuart mentioned, thank our three sponsors, Bluebird Realty, KOA, Dave Taylor, and Cochevers. Uh, at the end of this presentation, there's going to be uh, two trivia questions. I've heard that uh, all of you folks out there think that they're too easy. Well, this one's going to be a little tougher. And this is the book that you're going to be uh, vying for, Around Monarch Pass. Skiing is about ready to rock and roll here in the Gunnison country, and that will be the prize for the answer of the trivia questions. Also, I uh, want to remind everybody that I'm going to be talking live on November the 14th, this coming Monday, and uh, hopefully a lot of you folks can join me as we talk about the Colorado River Compact and the implications of the drought that we're in right now. Seven o'clock, Crested Butte Museum on Monday. Tonight, we are talking about Gunnison country, the background of the history of the Gunnison country and the town of Gunnison. So let me remind everybody what we talked about a little bit last week. Here are the boundaries of the Gunnison country. Lake City in the south, Marble in the north, Monarch Pass in the east, and Cimarron in the west. The Gunnison country has always been known as a very extreme area in the United States. 700 inches of snow has fallen at Gothic and Kebler Pass in previous years. Cold weather, Taylor Reservoir, 61 below zero in 1961. For 24 years, that was the coldest temperature ever recorded in Colorado. Maybell, Colorado, northwestern part of the state, beat us out in 1985, one degree colder. We also have uh, the distinction of being one of the four coldest towns in the US. 
International Falls, Minnesota, West Yellowstone, Fraser, Colorado, and Gunnison. We also have six mountains, 14,000 feet or better, the Elk Mountains between Crested Butte and Aspen, and the area has one great canyon after another, highlighted by the famous Black Canyon west of town. Prehistoric people existed here 10 to 12,000 years ago. We have found artifacts on top of W Mountain, on Signal Peak. The uh, game drive up above the Monarch Pass ski area dates back thousands of years ago. So many people were here a long time before uh, people came in that we regard uh, rather old, about three or 400 years ago. 2,500 Ute Indians lived here in the summer. They lived here in the summertime. They were smart enough to get out into the Uncompagre Valley in the winter. And in 1868, there was a treaty signed that moved the Indians west of the 107th Meridian. Now that would be about four miles to the west of Gunnison and Crested Butte. And as a result of moving them out in that area, they created, the federal government created the Los Pinos Indian Agency, which was not far from Cochitope Pass. And then in that same year, they also created the Gunnison Cow Camp that existed right about where the Timichi and the Gunnison Rivers came together. We call today Dos Rios, the meeting of two rivers. If you ever play golf at Dos Rios Golf Course, it's right around the 13th green. So the cow camp existed as early as 1868. Coming in in 1872 was a man named Alonzo Hartman. And you see him there with his family at the famous Hartman Castle located today at the KOA campground. Hartman rode in in a driving blizzard on Christmas day of 1872 to take over control of the agency. He along with Jim Kelly, Herman Luter, Sidney Jocknick and Josiah White ran 2,000 sheep and 3,000 cattle in the Gunnison country to be used for the Utes. Five years later in 1873 came the Bruneau Treaty, which pretty much took the San Juan away from the Indians and moved them out of the Los Pinos Indian Agency. They were moved out to Kelowna, about 12 miles south of Montrose along the Uncompagre River. Four miles to the north, they had a little place called Fort Crawford, and you can still see the interpretive sign there, about eight miles south of uh, Montrose, and the Indians were now controlled by the White Agency. Following the Meeker Massacre of 1879, the White River or Northern Utes were moved to Utah, and so was Chief Uray, his wife Chipita, and the Uncompagre Ute Indians, moved out to the Uinta Indian Reservation. And that allowed the Gunnison country to be opened up to white settlement. Spain followed the Ute Indians into the Gunnison country just after 1600. And there is a, a picture of a, a Spaniard uh, somewhere in the Southwest, just a caricature of them. Spain came in here and the original name of the Gunnison River was called the Rio de la San Xavier. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Spain and the Gunnison country because a lot of the records were in Spanish and a lot of the expeditions who came out here, which came out here, were uh, in secret because if anybody found any gold, if it was a regular expedition sponsored by the crown, then a lot of the money had to go to the crown. So you kept your mouth shut, engaged in illegal expeditions and kept whatever you found. Spain was in this area looking for gold, chasing escaped Indians from their mission stations in New Mexico. And they were also looking for a good road from Santa Fe to their 24 mission stations in California along the famous El Camino Real, the Royal Road. 24 mission stations that ran from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco. Don Juan Rivera, 1765, got to the present site of Delta. He and his men, 20 of them, signed their name on a tree, carved their names into a tree. Many of his scouts got into the Gunnison country that early. Juan Baptiste de Anza, 1774, chasing Comanche Indians, got out where Monarch Pass and Poncha Springs are today, and his scouts got into the Gunnison country. And then the famed expeditions of Fathers Escalante and Dominguez, 
1776, trying to find an overland road from Santa Fe to California. They also came close to the Gunnison country. Spanish existence in the Gunnison country, however, was brief. They found little gold, the Indians proved to be very tough, and the weather and terrain were very difficult. And on top of that, they were way away from their supply lines. And then came the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, when President Thomas Jefferson purchased all the land from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and from Canada down to the Rio Grande River. And that marked the end of any hope for Spain in our area. But now, with the Louisiana Purchase, President Jefferson had to find out what we had bought. And he now sent out two great survey teams. One was led by Meriwether Lewis and uh, William Clark. And they left St. Louis in 1804, heading up the Missouri River and went all the way out to the West Coast to about where Portland, Oregon is today, Astoria is today. When they came back, they filed their report and one innocuous sentence simply said, the mountains are teeming with beaver. The that same year that Lewis and Clark came back, another man headed out to explore the Southern area of the Louisiana Purchase Territory. And his name was Zebulon Montgomery Pike. And Pike got into South Park, over Trout Creek Pass, where Salida is today and then uh, all the way out towards the Royal Gorge before winding up being captured by the Spanish and being released across the Rio Grande in 1807. His report also said when it came out, the mountains are teeming with beaver. And that led to the next group of people coming into the Gunnison country, the great fur traders. Every Tom, Dick and Harry lined up in St. Louis in the spring of 1807 after reading those both reports. And they headed out west to trap the pelt of the beaver. Black gold, they called it. Each beaver pelt sold for $7 a pelt. That would be in the hundreds of dollars today. And there's one of the trappers with his collection getting ready to sell those pelts. Three areas were trapped. The Southwest Fur Trade operated out of Taos, New Mexico. The Northwest Fur Trade, operated by Hudson Bay and Northwest Fur Trading Companies of England, operated out of Fort Vancouver, now Portland, Oregon. And the best of all the fur trade had its center in St. Louis and included that of the Central Rockies. William Ashley was the man who came in, a Franklin, Missouri businessman, who came into the Central Rockies and found out that Indians did not like forts. And as a result, he began the rendezvous system. 13 rendezvous points in the central Rockies, holes in the mountains where people could get together. Trappers would bring their furs to that spot and suppliers would come in from St. Louis with names like Brown's Hole, Ogden's Hole, Jackson's Hole. The trappers would trap in the fall and they would start near the top of the mountains where the streams would thaw out first and they worked their way down to the bottom where they would thaw out last. And then in the spring of the year, they'd start where the, in the lower elevations where everything would thaw out first and they would work their way up to the top of the mountains where everything would thaw out last. Fall and spring hunts, Rocky Mountain rendezvous, the first thing at the rendezvous where the trappers and the suppliers got together, they asked for news. And then they sold their furs. And then the next two weeks was a roaring party, a lot of drinking, a lot of gambling, a lot of shooting contests. And after two weeks, the mountain men exhausted, their money was exhausted, they were exhausted, they stumbled back into the wilderness. Ezekiel Williams was in the Gunnison country, one of the fur traders. And he said that, and I'm quoting now in an 1823 report out of a Missouri Gazette newspaper, he wrote the mountains in the Gunnison country and it wasn't called the Gunnison country then, not good for fur country because the rivers was froze up too much of the year. The mountain men copied the Indians in scalping. Their eating habits were very primitive. And then in 1842, it was all over. From 1807 to 1842, the great fur trading frontier lasted 35 years. The streams were now trapped out. 
prior, the price of a beaver pelt fell to one buck because Bo Brummel had invented the felt hat over in England and the Indians had become very dangerous. So the Ute Indians, the Spanish, the fur traders, now came the explorers. And the explorers came into the Gunnison country. Most of them were looking for a good transcontinental railroad route. $150,000 had been put into the four surveys that came in 1853. A northern route was surveyed by Isaac Stevens, Duluth to Seattle. A southern route, Billy Park, New Orleans to San Diego. A south central route, Emil Whipple, Memphis to Los Angeles. And the 39th parallel route covered by John Gunnison. Gunnison was 41 years old a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and it was from Goshen, New Hampshire. He had 32 men and 16 six-mule wagons. He left Leavenworth, Kansas on June the 15th, 1853. His route took him over Bent's Fort, Levita Pass, San Luis Valley, Sawatch, over Cochito Pass, and into the Gunnison country in September. His men had a hard time crossing the Lake Fork of the Gunnison, and then stunned by the next gorge, had to parallel the Black Canyon and ultimately passed into the Uncompagre Valley. His expedition ended in October when he and seven of his men were killed by Paiute Indians in southwestern Utah. The high passes and the rugged canyons meant that no transcontinental railroad would ever go through the Gunnison country. The famous path marker of the West, John Fremont also went through our area. And there he is in a fancied uh, photograph or drawing in 1853. He came through here during the winter of 53 looking for a railroad route. By the 1950s, because of the Gunnison and Fremont publicity, the Gunnison country is now considered to be part of the central route to the Pacific. However, the heavy snow, the cold weather, the rugged mountains and canyons and dangerous Ute Indians kept the people out. Yet, rumors of gold and silver in the mountains abounded. That was the era of the explorers. Now came the placer miners. One group of frontiersmen who weren't afraid of the Gunnison country were the placer miners. Now, a placer miner is a gold panner, the day of the individual miner with a gold pan, the man would scoop out a little debris out of the bottom of a stream bed, gently rotate it slightly downhill with water, and then all of the light stuff flowed out. What was left in the bottom of the pan were little pebbles, which were picked out with forceps. And then, if you're lucky, what was left in the bottom of the pan was black sand, heavy gold that didn't float out. You poured a little mercury in the bottom of the pan, which amalgamated or linked up with gold, then you burned the mercury off, and what was left in the bottom of the pan was always called pay dirt, the dirt on the bottom of the pan that paid. By 1860 and even before, in came the placer miners. A crudely built fort on a high timbered ridge near the divide between Needle and Razor Creek east of Gunnison was splattered by lead bullets and probably at least 50 years old. Other evidence of placer mining long before 1860 existed in Taylor Park along the Crystal River and a snowblind gulch not far from Monarch Pass. In 1861, a Methodist missionary made his way into the Gunnison country over Lake Pass at the north end of Taylor Park, Spring Creek, Dead Man's Gulch, which he named because he saw the bleaching bones and dead horses bleaching bones of six miners and their horses killed by Ute Indians the previous year. And then he worked his way up to where Crested Butte is today, headed up Washington Gulch and preached to 250 miners at a place called Minersville at the head of the Gulch. Gold at that time sold at 20 an ounce. It's selling at 1800 an ounce today. And Father Dyer wrote about this in a great book called The Snowshoe Itinerant, writing about Minersville at the head of Washington Gulch. And then came Jim Taylor and Fred Lottis in Taylor Park and Union Parks in 1860 and 61. 
Taylor came into Taylor Park for the first time in 1860 from Granite following an Indian trail over Lake Pass. He looked at Taylor Park, this massive park, 30 by 10, 10 miles wide, and one creek after another ran out of the mountains and into the Taylor River. Tellurium Creek, Illinois Creek, Texas Creek, Cottonwood Creek, Willow Creek, perfect for placer mining. He went back and later in the year came back in with four men and they trapped, they panned around Willow Creek. And as he panned one day looking for horses which had escaped that morning, Jim Taylor took out his tin cup, scooped out a little water out of Willow Creek and found a little gold in the bottom of the tin cup. And he panned out a half an ounce of gold. Keep that in mind for a little later. Fred Lottis followed Jim Taylor in, lost the route, and came in via Lottis Creek, where Gold Creek is today around Ohio City. He thought he was in the same park, but he was really in an adjacent park that he called Union Park. So placer mining went on in Taylor Park and Union Park in 1861. The weather, the Utes, no great strikes, and the Civil War ended mining in that area. Both men went off to war, Taylor and Lottis. Taylor never came back, wound up dying in Arizona. Fred Lottis came back a lot, took out $5,000 worth in his diggings every year along Lottis Creek, sold his diggings to a Leadville party in 1881 for $55,000, continued to come in, and then died in 1900, coming in the same route he had come in 39 years before over German flats. He fell dead of a heart attack and, and froze to death, freezing to death and a heart attack, probably both killed him at the same time. Placer mining went on in the Gunnison country from 1860 to 1870 and turned out between three and $6 million worth of gold. Remember at 20 an ounce. It's $1,800 an ounce today. The miners were everywhere. Crystal River, Armstrong Gulch near Pitkin, Taylor Park, Snowblind Gulch, Needle Creek, every possible stream was panned. By 1870, that era was over. The streams had been panned out. The Ute Indians were furious about white miners trespassing on their land and isolation made mining very difficult. So the day of the Placer Miner was over. And now we come to a new decade. And the new decade was the decade of the surveyors. After the Civil War ended in 1865, much of the West was still unknown. The expeditions of Lewis and Clark, Zebulon Pike, Stephen Long, Gunnison and Fremont had only passed through the regions of the West. They had only been in an area for about a day. They didn't know a whole lot about the flora and the fauna and the geography. Ridiculous rumors existed. Hot water spouting 100 feet out of the ground. Everybody knew that was a lie. A wild river through a canyon that ran God knows where. That had to be a lie. And natives living in the walls of canyons. That had to be ridiculous. A scientific study would quash all those rumors. You're looking at one of the great surveyors right there on top of Salton Mountain up above Silverton, part of that great survey of the American West. In 1867, Congress appropriated money for the great surveys of the American West. There's one of those rumors. That's Old Faithful spouting 100 feet out of the ground in Yellowstone. Nobody knew that was true until the surveys. The great surveys of the American West lasted from 1867 to 1879 and involved four survey teams led by Clarence Rivers King, John Wesley Powell, George Wheeler, and Ferdinand Vanderveer Hayden. All would have a marked impact on the Gunnison country. King would expose the diamond hoax in Northwestern Colorado. Powell, in addition to running the Colorado River for the first time, also wrote a great work called Arid Regions of the West, a brilliant look into the future of that area. However, Hayden and Wheeler had the most impact on our area. Hayden, with William H. Jackson as a great photographer, was the first guy to film the Mount of the Holy Cross. That is at the north end of the Sawatch Range today. 
another rumor that people thought didn't exist that really did. Ferdinand Vanderveer Hayden looked over Taylor Park, Spring Creek, Cement Creek, and the present site of Crested Butte. On a summer day in 1874, standing on top of Tiakali Mountain at 13,208 feet, Hayden looked off to the north and saw two great mountains, which he called the Crested Buttes. A little later on, people thought that one of them more resembled a Gothic cathedral and named it Gothic Mountain. And then they dropped the S off of the Buttes, hence the name Crested Butte Mountain, and later on Crested Butte. Hayden finished his exploration in the Gunnison country by following the East River, went by present day Gothic, crossed Schofield Pass and went down the Crystal River, discovering huge marble deposits on White House Mountain. One of surveyor John Wheeler's men, William Marshall, had an abscessed tooth in November of 1873 while near Silverton, and he needed to get to a dentist fast, but the closest was was in Denver about 350 miles away. Wheeler searched for a place maybe that would cut off some of that mileage. And he remembered a low depression in the mountains he had seen earlier, which would cut off a lot of distance. He made for it. He stopped on top of the depression, 10,846 feet high. And even with his toothache, took barometric readings and sketched a profile of the area. He got to Denver six days faster than the main survey party. Today, that pass, Marshall Pass, is named for him. The Denver and Rio Grande used it to get into Gunnison in 1881. It runs today from Pontius Springs to Sargent's and has some of the best raspberry picking in the Gunnison country. And that took care of the great surveyors of the American West. And now we come to the load miners, L-O-D-E. By the mid to late 1870s, that new era was at hand. Load miners began to come into the Gunnison country by the thousands in search of gold and silver. Load mining was a lot different than placer mining. Load mining involved going deep underground to find the main vein or the mother load. So you dig a shaft three or 400 feet deep, and then you dig tunnels every 100 feet down. And what you're trying to do is intersect the load or the vein and then follow it. <clears throat> that meant a lot more men, more money, more technology, and big companies now came in. The day of the individual miner is over. Gold, they said, sold at $200 a ton. And what that meant was that if you brought up one ton of muck and debris from deep underground, Somewhere in that uh, deep muck and debris were 10 ounces of gold, which sold at $20 an ounce, hence the name $200 to the ton. There is one of those load miners coming in with a four horse team and all the provisions that he needed as he went into one of the great mining camps. They came into the Gunnison country following the Colorado Mineral Belt, 250 miles long. 50 miles wide, running from northern Colorado southwest. Every great precious metal mine in Colorado is existing within that mineral belt, with one exception, the greatest of them all, second best in the history of the world, $35 billion from it, and still producing $400 million a year today, the great Cripple Creek and Victor, an extinct volcano. In that mineral belt, which started at Caribou in the north, Netherlands, Central City, Black Hawk, Georgetown, Silver Plume, Aspen, Leadville, the Gunnison Country, Breckenridge, Uray, Silverton, Telluride, all in the Colorado mineral belt. And of course, the Gunnison Country was in it also, but it was a very mysterious area, but a lot of rumors existed. From 1879 to 1882, 25 to 40,000 people came into the Gunnison country from all over the nation and the world. They came in over Lake Pass, Cottonwood Pass, Marshall Pass, Monarch Pass, Cochito Pass, and a lot of other high passes. A reporter for the Rocky Mountain News in the spring of 1879 declared, and I quote, 
During my stay in Leadville, it seemed as if the whole damn town were going to the Gunnison country. And on the day I left, I counted 50 outfits headed there. Hillerton on Willow Creek was the first town to exist just south of Taylor Park. By midsummer, the camp at a post office, a sawmill, one million pounds of freight in, a smelter and a thousand residents. Tin Cup, two miles north, followed with 2,000 miners in by the end of 1879. Other great camps followed much later in 1879. Pitkin came into being on Quartz Creek, Gothic at the junction of the East River and Copper Creek, and Spring Creek City near Dead Man's Gulch. Then came Irwin, also called Ruby, next to the beautiful lake with the same name, 10 miles west of Crested Butte. Near the headwaters of Tamichi Creek, three great mining camps appeared in 1879, White Pine, Tamichi, and North Star. Other mining camps, all with big dreams and optimism appeared. They had names like Crystal, Obi Joyful, Pittsburgh, Hidalgo, Quart, Schofield, and Dorchester. All were destined to have a short existence. The big five silver camps of the Gunnison country would be Tin Cup, White Pine, Gothic, Irwin, and Pitkin. Only Pitkin ever got a railroad, although the other four were promised rails. The big five had certain things in common. They all had between two and 4,000 people, most transient and many left in the winter. They all had promising silver mines. They all had problems of weather, transportation, and the price of silver. And they all had great optimism. When the silver panic of 1893 saw the price of metal drop down to 58 cents an ounce, the big five folded. There were attempts later to revive the mines, but the good days, good days were all gone. Two towns survived and prospered. They were Crested Butte where Coal Creek and the Slate River came together, and Gunnison, where the Gunnison and Michi joined. Those two survived because they didn't have all their eggs in one basket, like the mining towns. They were the supply town, the railroad town, the smelter town. Gunnison became the major town of the Gunnison country. It was centrally located. Its elevation was only 7,703 feet unlike the mining camps over nine and Irwin over 10,000 feet. And in addition, Gunnison also got two railroads, the Denver and Rio Grande in 1881, the South Park and Pacific in 1882. Gunnison became the hub of the wheel. It had begun as a dream of Sylvester Richardson. And there you see the man himself. Richardson had been on the John Parsons Geological Expedition in the Gunnison country in 1873. When that exploration ended, Sylvester Richardson stayed alone in the Gunnison country and walked 500 miles, finding the marble deposits, coal, and precious metals. But the thing that most excited Richardson was the possibility of a great agricultural wonderland with plenty of water, great valleys and plenty of sunshine. He went back to Denver, started the Gunnison Colony, and in May of 1874, took a hard month to come into the Gunnison country with 20 odd pioneers. Hard winters caught, led the new people to give up on farming and instead turned to ranching. Ranches soon appeared along the Gunnison to Michi, up Ohio Creek and along the East River. From 1874 to 79, only a few lived in the Gunnison country. Then it all changed with the great silver rush, which began in 1879. There you are looking at Gunnison in 1881 from the top of Cupolo Hill and back of today's Mountaineer Bowl. And there is the great Moffat smelter, which ran. A little more about that in a moment. All roads led to the fabled Gunnison country. Gunnison grew rapidly in spite of a feud which led to a divide between East and West Gunnison. The feud involved railroads, real estate was finally settled in 1886. From 500 tents in 1880, a building boom followed in Gunnison. 200 buildings went up along with saloons, gambling dens and houses of prostitution. 
10 to 20 wagons carrying 6,000 pounds each came into Gunnison daily. By 1881, the population had soared to 4,000. The area had great deposits of silver and coal and sandstone and granite and marble and gold and iron. Ex-President U.S. Grant was infatuated with the area and he made his way in on a trip over Marshall Pass, Gunnison, Ohio Creek, Irwin, Gothic, Schofield, and all the way out to Carbondale in the year 1880. In 1881, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad arrived followed by the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad. And there were two hangings in the Gunnison country, one illegal. This led to a man named Pete Theophile who had killed his boss, a railroad boss in the Black Canyon. He was hung on Tamichi Avenue. You're looking at the only legal hanging that ever happened in Gunnison. This is a black teamster on the South Park Railroad who killed another black teamster over a gambling debt. And in December of 1881, Thomas Coleman was hung right by the courthouse. <clears throat> From 1882 to 1884, the famous La Vida Hotel was built on Boulevard Avenue, four and a half stories high, $212,000 to build it, gold lace, crystal chandeliers, Persian rugs, antique and mahogany wood. It was, said one traveler, a peacock among mud hens. Then led by engineer D.J. McCann, Gunnison also got a $200,000 gas and water works. And you're looking at it. Very, very unique for a mining town at that time. 100 men dug trenches and laid pipe. The water works began operating on June the 27th. The gas works on August 29th. The new town now had water, light, and heat. By 1882, business lots sold for from one to $5,000, and 200 business houses were up. The population was now 5,000. There you get a good idea of Gunnison on the in, in intersection of Tamichi Avenue and Pine Street, and this is in 1881. Seven sawmills ran night and day to keep up with the building boom. Gunnison soon got two banks, the first one was the Bank of Gunnison in 1880 and a great story about that one. Sam Gill was hired by Horace Tabor to take a safe with $30,000 in it to start the Bank of Gunnison in 1880. He took a train to Alamosa, no train from there. He's got 30,000 in the safe. Nobody knew anybody, anybody didn't know that there wasn't, there was a whole lot of money in the safe. They just thought it was a safe. He couldn't get out towards Gunnison because of too much freight waiting ahead of him. So Gill donned overalls, mixed with the freighters for a week, then got a ride on a freight wagon after agreeing to do half the cooking, buy all the tobacco and whiskey and hitch and unhitch the mules. After a rough 14 day trip, the money for Gunnison's first bank finally arrived in town. When the driver inquired for Sam Gill and Gunnison, he was shocked that the dirty and bedraggled passenger was that man. And Gunnison now had its first bank. There's a shot of the Gunnison Review newspaper, 1880. Hard to tell if that's an irrigation ditch or a road with too much water in it. Things are pretty primitive that, at that time. One of the other great early men who came to Gunnison was Jack Haverly, a famous theater and minstrel millionaire and another key figure in early day Gunnison. His income every week amounted to $15,000. There you get a great shot of the Gunnison country, Gunnison in 1881 with the brewery. Now that building that says Schilling and Company dry goods and carpets is still there on the main drag of Gunnison, second in Maine. Haverly, as I said, amounted had $15,000 a week coming in, fascinated with the potential of the Gunnison country. In 1880, he came in. He soon bought ranch land, 1,500 lots in Irwin, Crested Butte, and Gunnison, and invested $250,000 in the mines. When he got to Irwin one day, he, was, uh, he saw a bunch of gamblers, about five or six men in a game. He walked up and he said to one of the guys, what are the stakes? The man sized him up as a dude and said, sky's the limit. 
Haverly began to pull, peel $100 bills from his pocket. The man who said, sky's the limit, gulped and said, I meant our local sky. It's only $20 high here. When the boom busted in the mining camps, Haverly lost everything, and he died broke in Salt Lake City in 1901. It was a scene that repeated itself many times in the Gunnison country. The greatest promoter of Gunnison was E.A. Buck, owner of a sports journal and land in New York, and a millionaire. He came to Gunnison in 1880. They invested $250,000 in the mines. He owned the Gunnison News, and he built over 250 miles of telegraph lines from Gunnison to Leadville and Aspen and Ashcroft and other areas. One of the guys he brought in to run his newspaper was a man named Nicholas Babcock of New York. He became editor of the News Democrat in 1881, dreaming, as he said, of an easy life of a country editor. And he said, I awoke in a hotter section than any of the old Bowery ever had. Babcock wrote about Ike Buzzard, who had forced the Crest of Butte postmaster to hold letters at an arm's length while he shot holes in them. Days later, Buzzard appeared in Babcock's office wearing two enormous pistols and said, my name's Buzzard, you running the paper? Babcock was too frightened to speak. Then Buzzard said, you run a smart paper for these parts. What does she cost? Buzzard paid for a year's subscription and walked out, leaving a badly shaken editor. In addition to the La Vida, Gunnison had many hotels, including the Red Lion on the corner of New York and Maine, which turned out into a house of prostitution. The Mullen House, New York and 10th, 40 rooms. The Tabor House on Maine and Virginia, 27 rooms. Early schools. This is the great school in Gunnison in 1881, the Pine Creek School. Another one was the 8th Street School, the 12th Street School, and the Georgia School. Gunnison also built three smelters to handle ore from the mining camps. The Moffat smelter was on top of Cupolo Hill in back of today's Mountaineer Bowl. Another one was the Lawrence and Shaw, three miles north of town. There's still a big red chimney that sits up there. And then there was the huge Tamichi Valley smelter, 141 feet long and three stories high, just south of the La Vida. The Smith Opera House started on, on, on uh, Boulevard. The foundry got started, a street railway was thought of, and sandstone quarries were used to provide sandstone to build houses in Gunnison, some of which are still there today. None of the smelters succeeded because of lack of technology and a silver panic. There is a great shot of, uh, of Gunnison. And this one is looking on Tamichi Avenue. A bad blow hit Gunnison in 1882 when the county treasurer, Joe Cotter, disappeared with all the county's money. A very popular backslapping Republican, Cotter disappeared with $100,000, leaving the county broke. The winter of 83 84 marked a downturn in the Gunnison country. Heavy snow and then heavy spring rain, said the paper, quote, caused the most disastrous floods ever known here, sweeping away bridges, washing out railroad tracks, and inundating ranches. That's a great shot of the Levita Hotel right there, four and a half stories high. Weather, isolation, lack of high-grade ore in the mining camps led to depression. The good times and the heady optimism of the early 1880s which saw Gunnison with 6,000 people and dreaming of becoming Colorado State Capitol were gone. The Gunnison country now settled into a more tranquil existence. It became one of the great ranching areas of the West. In 1910, this area had 40,000 cows and 10,000 horses. In 1949, at his dispersal sale, where Castle Mountain is today, Soon to be Governor Dan Thornton sold two bulls for 50,000 each, and Gunnison became famous for its West bred cattle. In addition, coal became king in Crested Butte, with the CFNI Big Mine, the third largest in the state, operating from 1894 to 1952. 
In addition, eight other coal mines existed in and around Crested Butte. And then in 1911, Gunnison got Colorado State Normal School, a two-year teacher training institution and the first in Western Colorado. By 1923, it had become a four-year school, Western State College. One of his professors, Dr. John C. Johnson of the biology department, started the world famous Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which did high altitude work. It's still there today, carrying out good work. And of course the railroad still ran. South Park until 1910, the Rio Grande until the early 1950s. The Gunnison country also became a major tourist attraction in Colorado. Hunting and fishing were sensational. Scenic line of the West was on Denver and Rio Grande engines. And people came to see Marshall Pass in the Black Canyon. Pioneer and Rosman Hill also brought people in. Today, the Gunnison country has 17,000 people, is the county seat of Gunnison County. 80% of the land is federal, brings in 2 million tourists annually, with tourism the second biggest industry, and it has the crest of it monarch ski areas. It is today a famous and unique area because of its past, and here's why. Now, my last slide I wanted to put up, a lot of you folks online today, on Zoom today, remember Johnny Grodeski and the Red Dolly Pub where you spent many a happy evening dancing and uh, drinking Johnny's great drinks. And that's the way it looked before it closed in 1982. Now here is the uniqueness of Gunnison and the Gunnison country. 80% of the land, federal. Cottonwood Pass at 12,126 feet, highest paved road over the Continental Divide in the US. Pioneer Ski Area, three miles up Cement Creek. First chairlift in Colorado, 1939 and 40. Western State College, highest four-year college in the US and the first on the Western Slope. First grade Bureau of Reclamation project was the Gunnison Tunnel, diverting water from the Gunnison River all the way into the Uncompahgre Valley. And the Gunnison country has the top pure white marble quarries in the world. Produced white marble for the Lincoln Memorial, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Washington Monument still running today. And the Aberdeen Granite Quarry, just four miles southwest of Gunnison has produced the granite for the outside of the Colorado State Capitol, marble for the inside. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a lot more on the uniqueness of Gunnison and Gunnison County, but we're gonna do it next week. That is it for today's presentation. And now, Stu is gonna tell everybody how to answer as I give you the trivia questions and there's gonna be two of them and it's first come first serve. And remember, they're gonna be a little more difficult than they were before. And this is for the book Around Monarch Pass. So Stu, there you go. All right, uh, for the trivia questions to answer, you can just type into the chat there. Uh, first response that we get uh, will be considered the winner. So there's gonna be two. Uh, two rounds, and yeah, let's get to it. All right, here is the trivia questions. We got to answer both. Number one, I want to know the big five silver camps of the Gunnison country. And number two, I want to know the quarry that provided granite for the outside of the Colorado State Capitol. We await the answers. Put them on the chat box. First come, first serve. All right, we got the Aberdeen Quarry. That's right. Now, what's the next one? Tin Cup, White Pine, Gothic. Oh. Tin Cup, White Pine, Gothic. Tin. Very good. Andy Cadlick, I think, is first. Andy, this is sensational. You got Tin Cup, White Pine, Gothic, Irwin, and Pitkin, and the Aberdeen Quarry. Donna, you came in with the correct answer, but a little late. So, Andy, you're going to get the book. And uh, what I want you to do is uh, 
give uh, Stu on the chat box your address. Now, while we got a little time here, are there any questions or comments that anybody has regarding the presentation today? And incidentally, next week, uh, November the 15th, Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, we are gonna have the five great silver camps of the Gunnison country. The great silver camps of the Gunnison country with one great story after another. Andy, thank you for the uh, information on your address. Uh, Karen Zolenko, <laughs> Zolenko, I remember you, Karen. Love seeing the red dolly photo. Anybody else with any comments or questions on the chat box? You go right ahead. Love to hear your opinion on what we talked about and uh, maybe any questions you might have. And Andy, thank you very much for winning. Mark Ellis, where did they get the mercury for placer mining and how much did it take? Well, the mercury was brought in by rail from Denver and it didn't take a whole lot, but, but as you know, uh, it's very dangerous. So when they used it, they kept reusing it. Uh, but as I said, very, very dangerous. So Denver by rail. Any other questions or comments? Karen, I know you spent a few hours in the Red Dolly Pub. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy Rowe. Appreciate the uh, kind comment. I want to say hi to my uh, good friend, Larry Tanning and Chris, who are on board today in Costa Rica. That's one thing about Zoom, you go all over the place. Any other questions or comments? I hope everybody had a chance to vote. And I hope that all of your candidates did well, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or independent. Any other comments or questions, folks? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tempe. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate everybody for being on. Valida, wow, thank you. New name. Thanks for being on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Melinda, thanks a lot. Stu did a great job. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, folks, before we shut it down? Hopefully I'll see everybody on board with even a few more people. Yeah, Vicki, thank you very much. We had a good group on board tonight and we hope uh, even more next time. Thanks, uh, Pete. Enjoy the presentation. Yeah, and we are gonna mention again, remember the veterans and their families on Friday, Veterans Day celebration, uh, November the 11th, 11th day, 11th minute of the 11th hour, the 11th day, end of World War I. And uh, Stu, tell everybody about the museum being open uh, from 11 to 5, I think, on Veterans Day, right? Yes, we'll be open and veterans get free admission. And we also have a new display going up that is centered on the veterans in the Gunnison Valley. So come out and check it out. That's great. And, and Pete, I assume they'll have a great ceremony at, uh, at uh, Legion Park again. Uh, Pete Dunda, of course, a great veteran from the Air Force, fighter pilot in the Air Force. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Valida. Over and out.